To start the academic extravaganza with a bang, let's hand it to Her Highness Dr. King, who will take us through the clinical nitty-gritty of urgent stress incontinence over two sessions. Now, we only have 15 minutes, so I'm not going to pretend that this is the complete answer to stress incontinence or to any sort of incontinence, but it gives you an approach, okay, which is what we need. Now, this slide I think is really important. If you follow this process with any problem that confronts you, it will it will help you get it right and not muck up anything, okay, which is the important thing. So someone comes along with some incontinence, the first thing we want to do is we get an idea of what's going on. We get some details. We have to make sure there's nothing else sinister going on, okay? We have to make sure there's no great big pelvic mass that is pressing down on the bladder. So if you're going to treat someone, make sure there's no other problem that someone will pick up later and it will be very difficult to explain why you missed. So, diagnosis, your provisional diagnosis. Exclude other pathology. Then look at other things that are contributing. So we modify or we correct any of those factors that we can adjust. And always, unless it's cancer, the answer is always treat conservatively initially. Okay, so that's how we're going to approach everything. Stress incontinence you know about. Every patient who's referred to you, someone will say, oh, look, this is stress incontinence. And it's not usually. Stress incontinence is typically coughing, sneezing, jumping, laughing. Okay, it can get a lot worse. Now, the important thing is don't panic too much with stress incontinence. Sometimes you will get the 15-year-old overweight teenager whose mother says, look, you know, she's leaking urine onto her knickers, I know it's there. It does happen in nulliparous patients. So don't go overboard, okay? You make sure there's nothing strange, like an ectopic ureter or something that hasn't been picked up before now. But remember, young women, nulliparous women, particularly athletes, can have stress incontinence, okay? Basically, we're not a very good design. Who would have put the weakest part of our body down there where everything pushes on it? So you can see why it doesn't take much to overcome that. So it's really interesting too. Did any of you, do you remember a few um, Olympics ago, there was a little French gymnast, a beautiful little tiny little gymnast, and there's a picture of her doing a great backflip and there's a little spurt of urine coming out that the photographer has captured, right? She's got no other reason for stress incontinence except increased intra-abdominal pressure above what anyone's pelvic floor could handle. So you don't need to panic if you see a slightly atypical patient, right? Now, she comes along and she says to you, I'm 43, the children have grown up, so I've gone back to playing sport and I've got some leakage, okay? Very straightforward story, makes sense. Now, what you're looking for is other alarm bells. What else is in that story that doesn't quite fit with simple stress incontinence? Has she had pelvic surgery before? Could she possibly have some neurological disease? You know, if she says to you, one day my leg went wobbly and numb and then I had a spot in my eye, hey, we're thinking woman in her 40s who may have stress incontinence but may also have multiple sclerosis, for example. So this we don't want to miss. We want to make sure that that vagina and that bladder neck are just mobile. They're just a bit weak. They've lost some of their tone. They've lost some of their support. We don't want to find a big fungating tumour on the vagina six months later because we didn't look. Okay, you cannot make assumptions. You've got to rule out all of those things. Now, look, most people presenting with stress incontinence don't have MS, but just in the back of your mind, make sure it's not a funny story or something a bit, a bit complex. Now, we're pretty sure it's stress incontinence. 
what could be making it worse that we could do something about, okay? Because we're thinking of all the things that we could do which would mean we're not going to rush into surgery at all. Oestrogen, very important. If she's hypoestrogenic, if she's atrophic, the sphincter, the urethral sphincter, will also be poor in tone and vascularity, so she'll leak more. If someone is premenopausal or has normal oestrogen, adding oestrogen doesn't make a big difference. Weight, obviously, weight is so important. But, you know, if it was easy to be skinny, everyone would be skinny. So you can use it as a little bit of a motivator. Come on, we can get this better if we can lose some weight. But don't, don't make her feel so miserable and disappointed in herself that she won't even try. Smoking, of course, chronic cough. You can be as rude as you like to the smokers. We have to get them stopped. Some medications, there are not very many medications, but we did mention this yesterday, that alpha blockers, which you use for hypertension, or not very often now, but used to be, alpha blockers like prazosin, will relax the urethral sphincter. It will weaken the urethral sphincter. So you look very clever if you can go, ah, when did you start that tablet? And when did you start leaking? So then you would work with her doctors to put on another antihypertensive, for example. But medication, not really. The other contributing factors, as I said, exercise, heavy work. I don't know about here, but in Australia, people do the most ridiculous gym exercises, you know, guaranteed to keep me in work for a decade or more. All those things that just strain the pelvic floor and aren't sensible ways to exercise. Similarly, constipation. Now, the other group to be careful of are the postpartum women. I don't know if you have the yummy mummies. We have the yummy mummies. They're the ones who think everything should go back to normal after that baby and they should look as slim as before and their boobs should be the same as before, right? So we go back to exercise and, oh, my God, the baby's only six weeks old and we're leaking. They're the people you have to encourage look, it's not a big deal. We'll work on it conservatively. We do not rush in and do surgery um, in this immediate postpartum period. Okay, so it's sensible counselling. In terms of treating conservatively, pelvic floor exercises, as we learned yesterday, do work, but you have to do them and you have to do them properly. So a couple of things to remember, and this cropped up in some of our questions. If you are a couch potato, right, you don't do any exercise and you suddenly decide you want to be fit, you're looking at six months, aren't you? You are not going to be fit tomorrow. Pelvic floor is the same. You have to do enough exercise that you literally hypertrophy those pelvic floor muscles. So as well as knowing when to use them and how to use them, you need to bulk them up. So people have to persevere with their pelvic floor exercises. And if you can get someone working with them, their motivator, their bladder trainer, right, then you get much better compliance. There are also the little gadgets, the little cones we saw the physiotherapist showed us yesterday. They are really very good because if you don't concentrate and squeeze your muscles, they slide out. So it's actually quite good, a good technique for people. Some people cannot get where their pelvic floor muscles are and how to do it. So a lot of these aids are just to assist. They give you a biofeedback thing. that uh, They assist in your pelvic floor exercises. But they definitely work. Um, some of the aids to pelvic floor exercises are a rip-off, the magnetic chair we talked about, laser surgery. Most of them are just a way of getting those ladies to do their exercises properly and consistently. So whatever works for her. If an app works for her saying, oh, gee, you didn't squeeze as well today as you did yesterday, if that's motivating, fantastic, go with it. Um, just people do get a little bit boring with their apps and want to show you all the time. It's like, have you seen those watches that record how many times you woke up in the middle of the night? You know, the people, you don't do that, you're far too polite, aren't you? And they show you, they say, oh, my app says I woke up three times. And you feel like saying, well, nobody cares except your mother, you know. But <laughs> it's, people do get very boring with their apps, but if they're doing their exercises, then that's fine. Now, drugs for stress incontinence. Sorry, we don't have very many. As we said, make sure there's enough estrogen. And really, the only other thing is the SSRIs. And one of the particular um, 
the serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, duloxetine, which is marketed in a lot of areas in the world specifically for bladder effects. Other places it's just there as an, as, um, an antidepressant, probably not a very good antidepressant. This drug can work. If you've got gross hypermobility and gross incontinence, minimal effect, but it can certainly help delay surgery in other women. Now, it does cause nausea and it does cause loss of libido. So for younger women, that's not, that's not so great. Um, although if you've got you know, fairly bad coital incontinence, your sex life isn't great anyway. Um, and they may not mind if it actually works, but you do have to tell them that that's a problem. So the nausea, about a quarter of them, easily. Okay, well, she's tried really hard and you've tried really hard. You're not missing anything, but she's not getting any better. We've got to think about surgery. Now, this is where you may want urodynamic studies. And we talked a lot yesterday about what if you don't have your access to urodynamics. The problem is if you've got the diagnosis wrong or she's some funny mixed pattern or there's some voiding dysfunction, she won't necessarily do very well with surgery. And if she wasn't aware of that, you're pretty unpopular. So you just have to remember that while surgery is great for leaking when you cough and sneeze and jump and exercise, it is not good for those people who have urgency and urgent incontinence, lots of frequency. You have to be a little bit careful with the younger patients, particularly if they're going to have another baby. Um, and they'll all swear they're not, of course, and then they do. But it is silly to do a surgical procedure for stress incontinence and then someone turn around and have a caesarean section that they wouldn't necessarily have had. They're only having it to protect their sling. 50-50 whether your stress incontinence will get worse with another vaginal delivery after a sling, but it certainly has to come into your calculations. So I think you have to try very hard with younger patients for a couple of reasons. The mid-urethral slings are good. We are easily getting 15 years out of them, much better than we used to from the abdominal procedures, okay? So they're good, but they don't last forever. And if someone's, you know, 35 and she said, but I only care now, I won't care when I'm old, you can assure her she will care when she's 50. It still matters. So that doing it while you're young is not necessarily sensible at all. You do it when it is bad enough that it is impacting your quality of life. But you have to be aware that repeat surgery is never quite as good as the first operation that you do. So think about what might be happening in their life and, and are they just not coping because the body's changed? Is this something that will improve over time? Um, can we leave her surgery? The other group who, groups that don't do well, previous continent surgery, there's always something much more complicated going on there. Previous repair surgery, previous big pelvic surgery. I think you have to try very hard to get urodynamics on these ones to be sure you're doing the right thing. Um, smokers also do badly, okay? They're, they're tiny little blood vessels, they're terminal vessels, which we're getting to by the time we get down to the urethra and the retropubic area, um, are very much affected in chronic smokers. And they don't heal well. And it matters more with the sling because they're more likely to get mesh erosion. And then we get blamed for that. So the mid-urethral slings, now it's interesting, your situation here in India is a little bit different. I think you do far more transobturator slings. Most people would argue that the retropubic approach is preferable. Now, I a bit agree with you. I love doing a transobturator sling and I much less like doing a retropubic sling. More complications, more bleeding, much easier to perforate the bladder. But the retropubic slings are more effective, particularly if you've got intrinsic sphincter deficiency, okay? They are better in very overweight people. They're better in people who are going to be more active. You do get better effect in the long term. Now, if you've got someone who has a very irritable bladder as well, the mixed incontinence or the voiding dysfunction, your, your transobturator approach is probably better because it doesn't stir up as much urgency and it doesn't cause as much obstruction. So you have to look at what your aim is in this lady. 
are you prepared to accept less than perfect continence, but pretty good, but not risk the overactivity or the voiding dysfunction? And you, you just explain that to her as you go. So unfortunately, there's pressure in the rest of the world. Um, certainly in Australia, we've just had another guideline published suggesting that transobturator slings are only indicated in certain circumstances that your choice should be retropubic. And I did say to one of my colleagues, what do you do with your retropubic sling if someone has poor voiding, dysfunction, poor voiding function? And he said, we just make it a little bit looser. And I thought, well, what sort of solution is that? Surely you'd be better off doing a transobturator sling. However, that's what they do. The main problem with the transobturator is groin pain. There is an incidence, and I think particularly with the inside out, the inside out transobturator approach, where you can get more nerve entrapment and get more pain from that. But look, I would keep doing what you're doing, guys. There's a whole lot of reasons we choose which slings. In terms of abdominal procedures, you all know these. Unfortunately, there's huge pressure on us to all of those mesh averse patients, all the mesh support societies saying that, um, oh no, I want those old operations that don't use mesh. Well, you know, I was around when we did those old operations. Believe me, they are not as good as the midurethral slings and they can't be done on the older ladies, which is particularly important. I looked at the Australian figures and with the introduction of the midurethral sling, the biggest increase in surgery was in women over 70 years of age. Now that is really important. So let's not get too carried away. Yes, you can get a reasonable result with a birch colpo suspension or with um, pubofascial slings, but I tell you, you get more voiding dysfunction, it is harder to correct. So stick to your slings. I just very briefly mention these periurethral injections. If you have a fixed scarred urethra, wouldn't matter how many slings you put under it, okay? If that's been radiotherapied, if it's had multiple operations, putting a sling under it's going to make no difference because it's not falling down, it is just has no function. The whole sphincter complex is ruined. Now, with these ladies, you can inject and the, you can inject a collagen or a silicon, a hydrogel. This is the stuff they put in the lady's lips to make them do that, or they put in your wrinkles, yeah, um, on people who have nothing better to do with their lives. But these fillers can work reasonably well. There's big pressure, particularly in the UK, they go, oh, this is great operation, doesn't use any mesh. Yeah, it doesn't use any mesh, but it'll, you're lucky if you get a 50 to 60% improvement. So in some people that might be okay if they know what's happening, but it largely, the increase in this procedure has come out of the, the um, anti-mesh attitudes more recently. So it has a place, believe me, it has a place. It has a place in radiotherapy, bladders and things, but not on everyone. Okay, I'm sorry that was so brief and I'm sorry I've gone over time by 2.59 minutes. <laughs> Stop. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jenny. There is little change in the program. Please bear with us. Thank you, Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Such a pleasure hearing, Such a pleasure hearing uh, Dr. Jenny Kaur and uh, Dr. Jenny Kaur. Thank you. Outline stress incontinence so beautifully, so precisely, and so hilariously. Yeah.